Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us, as always, is Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Hinshaw will provide a brief update, and then we will open the floor to questions. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by mentioning that we have received several questions lately about COVID-19 cases identified in some Hutterite communities in the province. It is important to know that just as there have been cases in many other communities across the province, Hutterite communities have not been spared from this virus. As with any other community, Alberta Health Services works closely with both cases and contacts, as well as community leaders, to implement public health measures and stop further spread. In fact, this work started months ago in collaboration with the Hutterite Safety Council. This is a volunteer body of Hutterite spiritual leaders, educators, volunteer firefighters, safety instructors and medical first responders who serve their communities. I would like to express my gratitude to this council and to the community leaders who are working closely with public health to protect their communities both within and outside of their colonies. As I spoke about on Tuesday, it is critical to remember that stigmatizing those who get tested or those who test positive is a barrier to controlling the spread of the disease. This virus affects all of our communities. As Albertans, we share a common responsibility to support each other through these challenging times. For today's update, I am pleased to report that 8,142 Albertans have now recovered from COVID-19. We've conducted more than 8,200 new tests and unfortunately, we have identified 120 additional cases in the province, which is up significantly from yesterday. This is the first time since May 2nd that we've identified more than 100 new cases in a single day. Currently, 69 people are in hospital, eight of whom are in intensive care. Two more Albertans have died. I'd like to extend my condolences to family and friends of all those who've lost loved ones during this time. In addition, we have added three new regions to the watch list, bringing the total number to seven. These regions are all being monitored closely and no additional measures are being taken at this time. While we have additional cases, I want to speak about something that has been especially difficult. This pandemic has been very, very challenging for residents in continuing care facilities. To date, 119 of 165 deaths in Alberta have been residents in these facilities. Protecting residents from COVID-19 has required placing severe restrictions on visits, which helped limit and prevent outbreaks, but also took a toll on those living inside these facilities. Last month, I heard from thousands of residents, family members and facility operators and staff on the impact these restrictions have had and on ways we can safely relax some of them. There are no risk-free options with COVID-19. This virus is still here and residents in these facilities remain uniquely vulnerable. At the same time, we must also consider the overall health and well-being of those residents and the risks of isolation brought on by strict universally applied visitor restrictions. These residents need hope, joy and connection, just like all of us. Today, I am announcing that Alberta will be shifting from a restricted access to a safe access approach starting July 23rd. We believe this will help people remain socially and emotionally connected while still protecting those who are most at risk of severe outcomes. So what does safe access mean? Under the previous restricted access policy, a resident could have only one designated family or support person spend time with them indoors and only when physical care or quality of life needs could not be met by staff. All other visits had to be outdoors in designated areas for only two visitors at a time, one of whom had to be the designated support person and all visits were by appointment. We heard clearly from residents and family that these restrictions were causing great distress and in some cases profound declines in health status in residents who grew depressed, isolated and lonely. We also heard very clearly from residents and family that COVID-19 remains a threat of concern 
and that visitor policies need to retain measures to limit the risk of introducing infection into these facilities. It is this balance that the new approach of safe visitation aims to improve. We heard from our consultation that not all congregate care sites are the same with respect to the risk of severe outcomes for the people who live there, the risk of transmission within the group, and the risk tolerance, values, and wishes of the residents who live there. That is why one key part of this new safe visitor policy is a requirement that each facility develop a local visitor policy for their site based on consultation with residents, families, and staff. While the baseline for the number of visitors allowed will be opened somewhat for all facilities, we are also setting out the possibility that some facilities may be less restrictive if their residents collectively agree to accept more risk. Under the new approach, we are also explicitly recognizing that family and friends are part of the care team for individuals who live in congregate care facilities, not just social visitors whose time with residents is discretionary. With the new policy, each resident can designate two support people who will be able to visit indoors for as long and as often as they wish, as long as they coordinate with the facility. Depending on the resident's health, outdoor visits will be allowed with up to four other visitors in addition to the resident, no longer requiring the presence of a designated support person. In some circumstances, when it is safe, these other visitors may also be able to visit indoors if a facility has a designated indoor visiting space as a part of their local plan. We have also expanded the definition of when a resident would be considered to be at the end of their life. And we have expanded access to visitors for palliative patients and those experiencing a medical or social crisis. In addition, we heard concerns about the lack of a process for appeals when there was a, a disagreement between residents, facility operators and family about visitor requests. There is now a requirement that each facility establish a formal appeals process for visitor decisions. Finally, I know it has been difficult and painful to avoid hugging and holding hands with loved ones, so we have also developed guidance for doing so safely. Of course, with more visitors comes more responsibility to keep people who live in these facilities safe. We heard in the consultation that people who wanted to visit more were also willing to take on additional responsibilities. The new restrictions give guidance on how to assess the risk of visitors potentially having been exposed to COVID with more flexibility for low risk visitors than those who would be at higher risk. Anyone who wishes to visit a loved one in a continuing care facility can facilitate more options for visits by strictly following public health measures in their day to day life. Other measures, including staff and visitor symptom and exposure screening and restrictions on staff working at more than one facility will remain in place. COVID-19 is still here and is still a risk to these facilities. Please stay vigilant and act responsibly. If you are visiting a loved one, check out the safe visiting practices online and the policies that your specific facility has in place to ensure the health and safety of residents staff and other visitors. As always, practice good hygiene and be sure to stay home if you are feeling even a little sick. I want to repeat that this policy will come into effect not until next week to give facilities and operators the time to make sure that they work this through and they know how it will be implemented. So anyone wishing to visit, the current restrictions will remain in place until July 23rd. We have also made another few small changes in our restrictions in the province. Effective tomorrow, we will also be permitting indoor exhibits and trade shows, outdoor vocal concerts and wind instrument performances, and outdoor hot tubs and whirlpools to open. These activities will still need to adhere closely to physical distancing measures and the other public health guidance provided. 
We are making these changes because the evidence shows us that these particular activities are not adding significant levels of risk and public health remains a top priority. I'd like to take the opportunity today to remind everyone why physical distancing matters. It may seem odd that staying two meters apart is still important as we reopen so much of our society, but it still is. Combined with other public health measures, this is one of the most effective ways to limit the spread of COVID-19. It is also one of the easiest to forget or possibly ignore. COVID-19 is mainly spread through respiratory droplets, that fine mist that comes out of our mouths and noses when we cough, sneeze, sing or puff after physical exertion. When you think about being outside in the cold, that mist that you can see when you breathe is the droplets. These micro droplets do not spread far. So the closer you are to someone spreading the virus, the closer, the greater your risk. As you've heard me say so many times, we must keep two meters apart from people who are not in our household or cohort group. For high intensity exercise indoors, that distance goes up to three meters. I understand that physical distancing can be hard in some places like restaurants and cafes. And we have heard from the tourism and hospitality industry that business is impacted by this restriction. I also know that beach space can be difficult to come by in Alberta and crowding is sometimes happening on beaches. It is true that some countries have different standards. Parts of Europe require 1.5 meters. Some countries require one meter or don't specify, but just recommend staying distant from others. The World Health Organization recommends at least one meter. However, in Canada, we have adopted two meters, which is the same as countries like the UK and South Korea. That is because physical distancing works. If you are more than a meter away from someone with COVID-19, you are five times less likely to get an infection than someone who is closer. And the risk is even lower when that distance is two meters. The farther apart you are, the safer you are. It isn't always easy, but it is important. Wherever you go this weekend, whether it's to the beach, a hiking trail, or an activity indoors, please stay two meters apart from others. I also want to remind us all that those who have responsibility for keeping us safe, like provincial park staff, should be treated with respect when they are doing their job. I have heard reports that over last weekend in several provincial parks, these park staff were subjected to verbal abuse and aggressive behaviors at places like Gull Lake, Kananaskis and Wabaman when they did their job to enforce public safety measures. This is not how to treat people who are doing their part to keep our parks as safe and healthy places to visit. This weekend, if you plan to visit a beach or other area that might be a popular destination, I encourage you to have a backup plan if the space is full when you arrive. As always, remember that in taking these steps, you are protecting everyone around you, including those who are at higher risk of severe outcomes from the virus. Remember who you're protecting. Treat all those around you as if they were that person you know and love who would be at high risk of a severe outcome. We are each other's best defense. So be wise, be safe, and let's all look out for each other. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, we'll go to the phone now. Operator, could you put through the first question, please? This is James Keller with The Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Hi there. I'm just wondering, Alberta now leads the country in new daily cases per capita and a second to get back in hospitalizations per capita. Um, I'm, are you concerned that Alberta is becoming a COVID-19 hotspot? And what is your strategy to turn this around, particularly as we're lifting restrictions at the same time? I absolutely am concerned about our recent numbers and the increase in new cases that we've had, and particularly concerned about the number of cases where we don't know the source. It's really important for all of us to remember that even as we've eased some of the restrictions that we previously had in place, COVID-19 is not over. And we are working closely with Alberta Health Services to make sure that all support is available for contact tracing, for outbreak management and control, uh, and also working with communications to make sure that we are doing our best to reach all different demographics of our population. 
It's important to note that that risk is not evenly distributed across the province, so we are continuing to see cases in our major cities. Uh, we are again doing work to understand how those cases might be linked so that we're able to communicate where there's highest risk. And one of the most significant areas of risk continues to be social gatherings and gatherings where people are not observing physical distancing. I want to emphasize that the numbers that we're seeing today are a reflection of what transmission was happening about one to two weeks ago. And so the activities that we're seeing today will result in cases in another one to two weeks. So I am very concerned about reports of people not following physical distancing, for example, on beaches, as we saw this last weekend. I'm concerned about reports of people who are feeling that uh, public health measures are no longer important. Uh, and I think that we all need to work together because ultimately our, our success in the future is in all of our hands. No one person can solve this by themselves. We all need to think about what do these numbers mean for how we're going to act and behave in the next coming weeks because each one of us can make a difference in the choices that we make. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Next is Thomasina De Silva with Global TV. Go ahead, Thomasina. Hi there. I have a couple of questions, and um, one of them is about the outbreak at the FGL warehouse here in Calgary. Just wondering if you had any updated numbers and any concern about that. And then the second one, um, with the uh, hockey playoffs coming up, should bars be open at all when we see the number of cases rising so much? With respect to the FGL outbreak, there are currently 36 cases that we know of, six of whom have recovered, leaving 30 active. Uh, that is certainly uh, one of the outbreaks that has the most active cases at the moment. But again, as with all of our outbreaks, our local public health teams are working closely. We did, as we do with all outbreaks, offer widespread testing even of asymptomatic individuals. And sometimes what that practice does is it helps to surface cases quickly and uh, gives us uh, an indication of how many early cases we have. Uh, so that could be a reason why we had this increase in numbers. Uh, but again, public health is, is working with this company and making sure that everything that needs to be done to control the spread is in place. Um, with respect to having bars open, especially linked to the NHL, I want to remind owners of all establishments, whether that's a bar or any other place of business, that the guidance that we have posted online that outlines the expectations for operating continues to be true. And so each establishment is responsible for making sure that those guidelines are followed in their place of business. Uh, we have been working with Alberta Health Services and where there are places of business that have not been following those guidelines, that have been egregiously violating them. There have been uh, warnings issued, and I need to again reinforce that those business owners, it's in their best interest to make sure that their place of business is known as being one that is safe uh, and not one where an outbreak would occur. So again, I would encourage all of us, both as individuals and anyone who is responsible for a location of business or an organization, to take it as a point of pride to limit the possibility that spread could happen in that particular location. Operator, can you put through the next one, please? Julia Wong with Global News. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. First off, just hoping to get a quick update on the case numbers at Good Samaritan's Southgate. And also when it comes to the new visitor policy, what specific public health circumstances led to these rules being relaxed? Is now the right time to do that with case numbers going up in our province? And what would trigger those rules to become restricted again? The Good Samaritan Southgate Care Centre currently has 31 cases. I don't have the staff and resident breakdown, but of those 31, 23 are active. Uh, seven have recovered, and as I've mentioned before, unfortunately, there has been one death associated with that outbreak. With respect to the public health rationale for changing our visitor guidance, it's important to remember that public health is responsible for the entire health and well-being of people and populations. And we heard very, very clearly from residents and family members uh, and operators in the extensive consultations that we have done over the past several weeks that the visitor restrictions that are currently in place were leading to significant impacts on residents' health and well-being. 
And so what we're trying to accomplish with this is a balance between the overall health and well-being of residents while still limiting the possibility that there could be an introduction of virus into these facilities. With respect to visitor limitations, certainly when an outbreak is declared in a facility, any of the discretionary visiting that would otherwise be possible would be limited in that instance. There still would be the possibility for those essential support people uh, to enter, but again, that's based on very significant uh, restrictions with respect to being screened, wearing a mask the entire time they're in the facility, and again, there's the, the risk assessment process to ensure that visitors fall into that low risk group so that there's less of a chance of them bringing the virus in. So at a local level, outbreaks would restrict visitors at a site level. With a particular um, level of transmission, again, I think that one of the things we need to remember is that we need to figure out how we will live with COVID for many, many months to come. And there, there will not be a day where we wake up and COVID will have disappeared. So with these visitor restrictions that we're putting forward with this new safe visitor policy, we're doing our best to create a balance that we think we can live with, that keeps residents safe while at the same time providing them with that support that we think will serve us well, again, as we learn how to live with COVID and move into this uh, next several months. So I'm not sure there's a specific cutoff at which point we would change these policies again. But as always, we continue to look at the evidence and look at the impacts of changes. And we'll take that into account uh, if further changes need to be made. Operator, now can you put the next question through, please? Barry Tate with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, Carrie. Hi, thank you. Dr. That you're very concerned about the way the numbers are trending. I'm, what's the strategy? What, what do you plan to do about it and um, what the policy direction is? Is it a balance of we're comfortable with X number of cases and hospitalizations as a trade-off for opening the economy? We always knew that we would have a slight increase in cases as we move towards opening the economy. And I want to emphasize again that it's not just about opening the economy, it's also about realizing that people need multiple uh, different supports for overall health, which includes access to meaningful employment, social interactions, as well as protection from virus infection. So this move to reopen restrictions is about the whole health of the population, not just about the economy. Uh, I certainly remain concerned about the trends that we're seeing. Uh, I think that we can manage uh, a sustainable number of cases going forward as long as we have the ability to do rapid contact tracing, control outbreaks. Uh, this is something we've seen in other jurisdictions who've been able to manage spread without going back into significant restrictions. But it takes a lot of effort, not just on the part of the authorities on Alberta Health Service, services, it takes effort on the part of all Albertans. And that's again why I want to say that while our uh, strategies on how we're going to control this involve doing deep dives into the epidemiology of the new cases, understanding the trends, understanding if some of our policies need to be adjusted to limit areas of risk, uh, making sure that we are doing rapid contact tracing, that we shorten our turnaround times for testing, those are all things that are in our hands in all of our hands as all Albertans, every single one of us can make choices that will make a difference. Every day when we get up and go out of the door, we can think about wearing masks. We can think about staying distant from others. If we're feeling sick, stay home, get tested. The things that we've been talking about for many months now, every single time someone chooses to do those things, they make a difference. And that is in all of our hands. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? David Dormer with City TV. Go ahead, David. Uh, this question for Dr. Hickshaw. You touched on the sort of issues at the beaches earlier, uh, but we're seeing a similar situation um, at Chestermere today. Is there a point when your office or the province is going to have to step in at places like beaches and recreation areas? We have met this week with Alberta Beach, with Chestermere and with Sylvan Lake, uh, who all expressed concerns about significant crowding on beaches over the last week or two. I want to say that I sympathize with Albertans who want to spend our, our limited, lovely summer days at a beach. We don't have uh, 
a long stretch of good weather and even less this summer when there's been a lot of rain. So I absolutely sympathize with people who want to be outside enjoying the weather that way. Uh, but what we heard really clearly from all three of those towns is the need for additional guidance. So we are preparing a beach guidance document that will give more specific outlines of what's expected that will help them with respect to their enforcement. We talked about strategies and ways of helping people plan in advance and whether or not there would be ways of helping people think about uh, backup plans. So if they do pack up the car, go to the beach and the beach is already crowded, what are those backup plans? What, what options can um, families think about so that they have that second option to do if the beach is crowded? Uh, and the communication strategy to let people know that this is part of, again, what we all need to be thinking about doing. So we are continuing to work with them and continuing to think about solutions that we can work together in partnership. Uh, but again, this isn't something that any one group can do on its own. This isn't something the province can do on its own. We need to work in partnership with these municipalities uh, and in the provincial parks with our colleagues in environment and parks to come up with the right solution. Operator, can you put through the next one, please? Shannon Scott with CBC. Go ahead, Shannon. Oh, hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Um, I guess I just uh, have a, a couple questions about this number. Um, 120 is a lot for what we've been seeing recently. I'm wondering if you have an idea of what it is that's causing the numbers to spike uh, like they are right now. And if that means it's the right time to do things like opening up things like outdoor hot tubs and, and outdoor concerts. The number today certainly is concerning. As you know, we've had cases hovering around the 80 to 90 mark for most of this week. And of course, today have now uh, gone over 100. So that is definitely concerning. Because the, the new cases need some time to be investigated so that we understand where they might have been acquired. We don't have a lot of data yet on the 120, but what I can say again over the last week is that we continue to see some of the same trends that we've talked about before. We continue to see uh, the highest single um, population demographics who are new infections are those who are in the 20 to 29 and 30 to 39 age group. Uh, we're seeing that those cases have, while new cases had on average a few months ago about six close contacts, we're seeing many of the new cases having uh, upwards of you know 15 or 20 contacts within their infectious period. So I think this is a reflection of many people feeling that uh, they're tired of the restrictions, they don't want to be held back anymore from interacting socially with their friends, from doing the things that they enjoy. Uh, and again, I really understand that desire because it is incredibly difficult to follow uh, the restrictions that keep us separate from our family and friends for long periods of time. So whether or not it's the right time to ease those three particular areas that we're doing today, I would say that outdoor hot tubs, um, they are licensed by uh, Alberta Health Services, public outdoor hot tubs, just like public outdoor pools. Uh, we have had public outdoor pools open for several weeks now. Uh, we have not seen transmission happening in those spaces. And there are operators that are responsible for making sure that distancing public health measures will be followed in those places. With respect to outdoor concerts, again, we've had the ability to have outdoor concerts for several weeks now. And the only thing we're changing is allowing wind instruments and singers to be able to perform in outdoor concerts with certain restrictions around distancing and barriers between uh, musicians where there are those kinds of, of activities that could potentially spread virus for further distances. But again, because it's outdoors, I don't believe that whether someone is gathering to hear a musician uh, play a non-wind instrument or gathering to hear someone sing, uh, that doesn't change that risk. So again, those two things are fairly minor. The third change we're making with respect to trade shows uh, we've again been watching our numbers and things like farmers markets or shopping malls uh, where we've had those open for several weeks and been watching to see. We don't see that those particular locations, again, where it's, it's not a social gathering, it's individuals who are attending a place of business for a particular purpose where there's distancing in place. 
uh, where there's monitoring, where there's an organizer who's responsible for ensuring that all of that is happening, we're not seeing that those locations are the areas of risk. And so I think these three things that we're opening right now, I don't anticipate will significantly increase risk. It really is about social settings and encouraging people to consistently be following those two meter distances, masking when that's not possible, staying home when sick, washing hands regularly. And if that happens in all of these settings, then we can collectively bring our numbers down again. All right, we've time for three more questions. Operator, could you put through the next one, please? Aaron Collins with CBC. Go ahead, Aaron. Dr. Hinshaw, thanks very much for taking my question. And I apologize if I uh, missed the answer to this earlier, but I'm curious if there was an actual firm number of cases that uh, you folks have connected directly to colonies here in, in our province. And if you have been able to directly connect those cases to Saskatchewan. Uh, so I don't have an exact number of cases that have been linked to colonies in Alberta. We definitely have had some cases with links to Saskatchewan. As I mentioned on Tuesday, uh, that's not unusual that we would have exposures across provincial boundaries and we've seen that in other settings uh, like parties across the border in BC. Uh, so we have had some of those linkages and again, um, in connections between Saskatchewan and Alberta with respect to heterite colonies, uh, but I, I don't have that particular number of cases in colonies on hand with me right now. All right, operator, could you put through the next one, please? Lauren Krugel with Canadian Press. Go ahead, Lauren. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you had available what the R number has been lately um, in Alberta and how that compares to where you would expect it to be at this juncture of the reopening and uh, whether it's at um, an acceptable level to maintain our, um, our status, our reopening status. I'll have to get the exact R number for you. Uh, I don't have it in front of me and I'm not sure that we have the number calculated uh, currently with the most recent numbers. I know that as of uh, about a week ago we had calculated it uh, as being over one and as people probably remember an R value of one means that on average most cases spread to one other person and if we're sitting at that R value of one it means that our case numbers will remain relatively constant um, and that if we can get it under one our cases will decline. So the fact that it has uh, gone up over a value of one again I, I'll have to get back to you about the specific number indicates that uh, we are seeing each individual case passing to more than one other person and therefore causing that, that growth that we're seeing in our numbers. Uh, that is, of course, a concern, uh, whether, again, we look at the R value, whether we look at the, the recent change in the, in the new cases, uh, that all essentially tells us the same message, that people are um, not following public health guidance consistently, again, for very understandable reasons. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be sure that we think carefully about how we act with each other going forward uh, because our, our success in our relaunch is, is going to be if we can keep that R value around one, uh, that's going to be a measure of our success. All right, operator, can you put through the final question, please? Final question is Audrey Nouveau with Radio Canada. Go ahead, Audrey. Hi, Dr. Insha. Uh, I have two questions for you. One is, that, could you please give us an update about the Misericordia Hospital uh, outbreak? And the second one is, uh, what are the facts or the, the thresholds that you think Alberta should cross before uh, reevaluating the um, restrictions, maybe going back in being uh, more severe again? So with respect to the first question, uh, we currently have 53 total cases associated with the Misericordia Community Hospital and that includes staff and patients and visitors and it includes both active and recovered cases. So uh, we have had an additional four cases identified as linked to this outbreak since my last update. Uh, with respect to the question, uh, and I should clarify with respect to the Misericordia that some of those cases uh, we had already known about but through investigation 
were linked back to, to an exposure at the outbreak. So they were cases that had been identified a week or so ago, but have only just now been linked to the outbreak. So not all of those are, are new and they don't necessarily indicate current transmission. As you recall, it can be up to 14 days from an exposure to when someone uh, becomes symptomatic. And therefore, it's not surprising that we would see a few new cases uh, happen even after we put those restrictions in place at the hospital. With respect to when we would look at uh, going back, so we've uh, been talking about our triggers, looking at hospitalizations remaining stable, uh, or at least not increasing by more than 5% daily over the course of several weeks, as well as our ICU capacity as strict triggers. Uh, we certainly also look at new cases and our R value as contextual factors, but we're not looking at going backwards at this point in time. We are still currently at a level where we can manage the number of new cases. Uh, but again, I would remind Albertans that we will only get through this if we work together, uh, that this is not something that the government is solely responsible for. This is not something that uh, any given organization is solely responsible for, but we all need to work together to make sure that we can get through this successfully. Uh, and we can see when we look to our neighbors to the south, examples of where things uh, have gone badly, where ICUs are full, where hospital capacity is overwhelmed, uh, and we need to work together to make sure we don't end up there. So again, I don't think there's a, a set threshold. Certainly if we hit our, our hospital capacity and our ICU capacity thresholds, we would absolutely be at that point, uh, but we don't necessarily need to wait for that. Again, we need to be watching our trends and numbers and we are having conversations on a daily basis about our trends and numbers and making sure that we're making, making decisions based on best evidence and our epidemiology. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Hinshaw will provide the, her next update on Tuesday afternoon. Thank you.